Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Geeky, a podcast where I sit down with some of my friends in the local Columbus, Ohio theater, film, and improv scene and talk a bunch of geeky stuff. Some of it good, some of it bad, but all of it definitely geeky. If you enjoy our program, be sure to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and to leave a review or subscribe wherever you can get podcasts. Our official sponsor of the show is Audible. With over 200,000 titles to choose from, get one audiobook and two Audible originals each month included with your trial, even once your trial ends and normal membership begins. Best part is you own your library, meaning you keep the books even if you cancel with easy exchanges. So if you don't love a book, swap it out for free anytime. Sign up for your free trial over at audibletrial.com forward slash goodbadgeeky. Download the Audible app and start enjoying your new audiobook now. Also, support for this podcast has been made possible by our Kickstarter backers, Ashley Carson, Catherine Ranella, Wooz, Yannick, Doug Poeta, Christopher LeBlanc, Andrew, Kenny, Jerome Wetzel, Casey May, Anonymous, Tavia Ordway, Anthony Portillo, Jen and Brian Petrie, Guest 16554255418, Laura Spires, Kimberly Barr, Kyle Jepson. We here at The Good, The Bad, and The Geeky want to advise listeners that this episode was recorded during the pandemic between the end of 2019 and the end of 2020. In this episode, I'm here with Jessica, Eric, and Becky. I'm sorry, I haven't been around anybody other than the husband for. Oh, no, it's okay. You're 100% okay. I literally think it was a Zoom thing where I think you said it and we just didn't hear it. Obviously, so Jess, Eric, and Becky uh, and I are going to sit down via zoom and not sit down next to each other because that's not responsible people and talk about the bill and ted saga aka bill and ted's excellent adventure bill and ted's bogus journey and of course bill and ted face the music on this episode of the good the bad and the geeky a word of warning there will be spoilers aplenty all over the place not just on this and just about anything else we may talk about and there's a lot of history stuff in there too that goes in and out music as well so listener beware if there's anything you want to say about any of the bill and ted movies Join us in the conversation by interacting with us via social media or email. Twitter and Instagram is username goodbaggeeky or email me at goodbaggeeky at gmail.com. We may read your comment on a future episode of the show. All right. Enough on my end. Station. Station. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take that back. Okay. Enough on my end. Station. That was great. All right. Oh, I got to stop recording. We're here to talk about, uh, we're mainly here to talk about Bill and Ted face the music, but we'll talk Excellent Adventure and Bogus Journey as well, which I did go back and rewatch. And I'm just, uh, we'll go around, uh, I'll start first, but we'll go around and get everyone's opinions of like the trilogy as a whole. And then like each individual movie, like just real quick, best we can. And I would say of the trilogy as a whole, I really enjoy it. The first two are really heavy for nostalgia, but Face the Music is really good and it capitalizes on what works in those first two movies. Becky, what did you think of the whole enchilada, if it were? Like you said, there's a huge nostalgia factor with the first two because I watched them both with my brother, you know, when he was a kid and I I view them through very rosy glasses. And watching them now, there are definitely things that don't hold up as well at the same time they're so adorably doofy you're like how do these people exist how i don't but then they're so damn cute yeah well that that, i i will say that the whole movie works even when it doesn't work because of alex winter and keanu reeves that's my take but but now eric what about you man what did you think of the whole Um, franchise so far with the final installment yeah i i'm i'm Kind of the same way, but I feel like the first two mostly hold up. I, it's one of those things where there's a couple instances, and I'll get into one in particular later, but there's a couple instances where it, it feels dated on a few things. But also, I feel like there's a lot of it there is hidden intelligence in, in all three yeah. of them. And I think part of it's played by the fact of how absolutely earnest and unironic that Alex and Keanu play those characters. They're never playing them for a laugh. I agree with that. Which I really like. And it's just kind of like that, you know, 
in, in 2020, I rewatched them all actually right before my, my 42nd birthday because this the third one actually came out on my birthday. It was kind of nice. Like I just rewatched them all as like a marathon that day. But it, that gentle humor, as you know, you and I have, have such a Ted Lasso love, mm-hmm. uh, was just something that to hit right about now was just like such a sweet spot. Even all three of them, flaws and all for the nostalgia of the first two. It was just kind of like exactly what I wanted right now. Jess, what about you? What did you think? I really, I mean, I really like the Bill and Ted movies. And this new one didn't end the way I wanted it to, but it ended the way I expected it to. I know I was texting you while I was watching it. But yeah, yeah I agree. Like, this all hinges on the fact that they are 100% serious in these, like, in their portrayal of these guys. And I mean, it is dated because, I mean, it's obviously like the 80s in the first one, early 90s in the second one, but I enjoy them. I think they're fun. I, I will say the only thing that did not hold up in any way whatsoever at all, and they did not do it in the third one. They didn't even address it that I'm aware of, but the whole fag comment was a little, like, it graded so, me so bad. So that, yeah, that was the one I was actually going to bring up. And then they yeah. did a callback to it in Bogus Journey, which, again, I can't... F- It's a callback. Like they're saying true to what they set up, but it was a little just, oh no, (laughs) they went back to that one again of all the things you go back to. I really wanted them in this third one to like do some kind of like unironic version of the hug and like now they're okay with it. Like they've accepted. I I, I kind of like that. That was, I was like, honestly, if I had one missed opportunity in my opinion is that the third one could have redeemed that joke in the previous two of basically them being no look we're grown up we understand shit now like we were dumb kids we didn't know any better we got better yeah i will say to uh, outside of that whole little scene in excellent and then the callback in bogus I think the other problem with me rewatching the first two was I watched them with my wife who had never seen them before and it, it was cringy to her. And I guess yeah. that energy maybe possibly fed into me because I think some of it's funny, but even some of the really high stuff, like the only time she laughed where he, the Grim Reaper is walking in the aisle and the guy's smoking and he's like, I'll see you soon. <laughs> she doing, she's like, that's the only funny part in this whole boring mess of a film and i was just like oh no I and i feel that like, into and, it and i feel like that's where like i'm with you nick is the fact that like especially like those two jokes in, in the first two are so cringy as well to me because like i'm not much younger than alex and, and, and keanu so it's like though that was me growing up you know a lot of that was kind of like that was oh, yeah. th- those were the older brothers that we were watching essentially at that point. Yeah. You know, and you're not, and, you're not and so it's like one of those things me. like, yeah, you know, like them saying fag and stuff like, yeah, when we were growing up, we also said that cause we didn't understand that. Yeah. No, this, you don't say this. And yeah. so I would have loved, that's where I would have loved to kind of have them come back that third one and be like the fact that, yeah, we, no one, told we didn't understand right and it's it's our fault for not understanding and for not realizing these things 100 percent. i i agree with you too and reading some notes trying to prepare for this about the first movie the first movie in general was just felt like we're not even we're surprised if anyone's ever going to see this like if it does finish getting made they're going to put it in a vault and never release it like legitimately like the fact that and we saw any of us had seen it is in itself like crazy but i'm with you too in terms of that like i i remember geez i mean i'm from a small hick town in the middle of, of ohio and it was acceptable or at least i thought it was even if it was done as a joke of being like gay or whatever and that's not acceptable at all right. like yeah but that's what i'm saying so like when you're watching it like I get why it was in there and I get because that was the time it was in. But it's yeah, it's a weird thing. Which, which is why I, I wish they had addressed it in, in a way of like saying, hey, we were wrong. But 
I think what's interesting and which I'm kind of sad that my wife didn't, I just love the idea that I think the thing that struck me about face the music though, was, is how in retrospect, I, I think that the thing that they don't pull attention to in the first two movies, or maybe not as well is how loving Bill and Ted are like legitimately <laughs> kind. Yeah. Like they were loving in the fact there was no judgment in the fact that this That's happened. True. Yeah. Like there was but no they, judgment of Missy. There was no, true. it was just teasing. Was it Bill who had asked her to prom? Yeah. Actually, like, oh, and then isn't it like Bogus Journey, like Ted admits that he also asked her to prom because in the third one, it was like, oh, and by the way, yeah, because like during their speech at the wedding, yeah. it's like, we both asked her to prom or whatever. Yeah. And then she became our stepmoms. Yeah. And you're just like, yeah. And, and that's why, I, I, that's one of those things where, and that's why I feel like it, like, not and not to harp on it for the last time, but, you know, not oh, addressing yeah. where there was like the one misstep, but the fact that they were good kids, they were loving this whole time. They could have easily played that as, you know, Missy's a tramp or something. And instead, the entire thing was played as the fact of men are idiots. That's yeah. And yeah. which is I, I, such a better way to play that. And that's why there's a part of me, too, that would have liked to. There's a part of me that wishes we could have got those two movies like right before face the music, like in terms of when they came out, because mm. I know that would have, or it would have been a little bit more well-defined because Ed Solomon and Chris Matthews, they're a little bit more, uh, a little bit more nuanced now as writers, they would have been able to find a way to really make that work better and keep all the same charm that's already there in those two movies. You know, I like, I completely forgot the girl who plays Joan of Arc in the mall. I forgot they got stuck in the mall. And yeah. I, I just completely forgot about that. And them doing the exercise aerobics, uh, Joan of Arc, just, yeah, just. <laughs> Jazz respect. Jazz respect. Absolutely killed uh, for, for the listeners, Jessica is performing jazz aerobics. Yeah. yeah like I, I kind of did like a horrible half ass version of it. Like I look like I was break dancing. You, you know what? You can't be self-conscious and you got to go for the big movements, Nick. I, I, I need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How are you? There you that's go. How you slim those thighs, Already. or whatever it was. They were I, you know, but and that's since we're talking about it, obviously before we get to the third one, that to me is one of those things where I really in this rewatch, I really want to know if they were being brilliant, or were being slightly lazy when all the other students are giving their presentations, and the one girl is talking about a Marie Antoinette. And she says, maybe now they would say, let them eat fast food instead of let them eat cake. And how that is so completely a misreading of the of what let them eat cake actually means. It's the exact opposite. And like such a bad take on what Marie Antoinette would mean. And still everyone politely applauds. And, like I'm, I'm trying to figure out in the fact that like not realizing that they are not the peasants there. They are a well-off high school in California. They are the ruling class. Yeah, like that's the thing about Bill and Ted is that even them themselves are like, they're on the lower end of like the higher class right. people in like San Dimas in California. The, and the girl completely misreading what Let Them Eat Cake stands for and then everyone's still applauding it. Like I didn't know if that was like such... That's either one of those things where it's a vicious, subtle satire of liberalism, or it's just, I don't know, have her say this. I don't know which one it is. I, I, I feel like, so from what research I've done on it, I kind of feel like it, it's kind of both. Yeah. Only in that, and I didn't know this until there was, I think there was like a small, like if I bought it when it first came out, like on Amazon's, like, you know, buy the whatever. And I thought it came with like a quick two minute, three minute, like behind the scenes. And I didn't know this, but apparently Bill and Ted started off as an improv joke between Matthews and Solomon and some third guy who just then didn't want to keep doing it anymore. But they kept coming back to it. Because it's kind of like the Dana Carvey thing where he does like Paul McCartney talking to John Lennon when he sleeps because John Lennon's in heaven and he's just sure. dreaming. And he explains to him things in the 20th century like, oh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, he's a little orange man, you know, with a little, little hair, you know, he has circles under the eyes. And John's like, oh, what's that all about? But it was them trying to explain to each other current events. 
Mm. And they're like, oh, we're going to do like an anthology movie of shorts. And I think Matthews's dad was just like, why don't you just the time travel bit is actually really funny. That should be the whole movie is those two guys. And then that's how it kind of spurs. So I feel like it could be like a genuine, like really intelligent, like written line, or it could have been, hey, throwing like improv lines out on this day of the set. I, you know, or even how the things on how they write, wrote that first movie, like, or are they just spinning out like, like it's an improv scene? Like it could go a number of ways, but I think it's like a weird version of the middle of that where it could be both. It's that stupid smart. Yeah. You're an improviser and I feel like all you guys can go through the entire barometer of like, you know, stupid smart. Once uh, I got married and had to sit through a few seasons of The Bachelor, Bachelorette, just kind of in the background, I picked up things and I could drop them into the middle of improv uh, sets, like referencing people who are current on The Bachelor, and like crowds would go insane. I didn't know who that, like anything about these people. I just knew this was a person from it. But yeah. Do we yeah. know if it was as known in 1980, whatever, that? Marie Antoinette did not say that with the meaning that she's been attributed to. Good question. I mean, some people had to know. I mean, it's, I, I have a feeling that like it's one of those things you had to go to the right books. <laughs> well, that's the thing is that if, if all the mainstream books though are of the one guy from that, was it the history channel about aliens where he's like mm. aliens, but it's like Marie Antoinette cake, <laughs> you know, it's right. But that's what everyone's watching. Then there's th that. Right. So that could be it too. Cause the whole point is the fact like when she's told the commoners don't have bread and she says, well, then let them eat cake because she's so out of touch that she doesn't understand. They don't have their basics and basic needs met. Sure. So by saying, let them eat fast food is actually exactly like, opposite about that and the fact you're telling them to eat garbage not oh I, I mean so here but here's the so i what other movie we just talked about it and it was one of those ones where oh clueless there are some things in bogus and excellent that do age well because of how they predicted things like mm. little tiny things about how people respond and react to things like I, I, you know I don't really remember the whole dude language really coming in big into play until, I mean, honestly, until Ninja Turtles, but that could be because that was what I was immersed in. But I, I just remember after that, I started noticing adults saying it to other adults, like dude, cowbunga, that kind of thing. And then, of course, if you would say Bill and Ted, they're like, oh, yeah, Bill and Ted. And they would do their little. So, I, but I feel like that was kind of ahead. And of the then they fuck time. it up and do Wayne and Garth. And you'd be like, no. Yeah, it's like if it's like a new pair of underwear versus constricting, but then it becomes a part of you. So that's my favorite Wayne's World line. Anyway, random aside, I would love to see the first director's cut where there all those scenes with like Garth and Rob Lowe, where he's building like a fake robotic Rob Lowe. I would love to see that. But apparently, like the first cut, it just didn't play as well or something. And so they chopped it out. And the only thing you see is when Rob Lowe talks to him and he's like beating the shit out of a hand that's what he's doing is building a rob android version of rob Lowe so he can like protect i don't know something it's weird anyway random side i mean uh, that takes us right into the second one with the oh. robotic bill and ted okay. so segue can i thank you yeah that's what i meant to do can i just say that i enjoyed bogus journey way more than excellent adventure in in different ways but i will i do kind of feel like Hey man, we made a movie in the first one. We didn't think it was going to get made, and now they're giving us money. Let's just do whatever the fuck we want, and because why not? Like, let's have weird little alien Martian guys that can join and, and call them Station. Which I, I found like Station is like a typo that they kept in or something. But although I absolutely love the fact of you thought the most intelligent being was a human. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I also like that the, the Grim Reaper cheats. Like, best, l let me guess, so I, best seven out of nine. I remember, like, when that came out, they ran, like, I remember seeing, like, an entire, I don't know, like, the, you know, behind the scenes, it's either HBO or MTV, kind of like first look kind of stuff, where basically they were talking about how the, all the literary references of challenging death to chess. Yeah. And like the the origin of that, and how like this, that, how, like and how where that actually comes from. Well, wasn't I see? I took it. It was making a reference to the set. Was I think it was the seventh seal or the seventh son? Where yes. like the one guy Max Bonsito plays the yeah. 
But if there was more than that, to me, is just absolutely fantastic. And honestly, doesn't surprise me, but that's awesome. I need to kind of know what those stories are. But yeah, it's in the seventh seal, but you know, it's also kind of like you know, a bit of a reference. But the yeah. fact that, you know, a movie like a sequel to Bill and Ted is referencing the seventh seal. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like it's again, it's that stupid smart. Oh yeah, like there was what was it in the first movie? An excellent adventure. Oh, another joke I really liked that I actually, I mean, I had to pause it because I was laughing so hard was they get Napoleon Bonaparte back. And during his speech, during their presentation, he's going over some, some kind of battle thing. And it's just such an earnest. It's like Keanu Reeves going, I don't think that's going to work, dude. And then yeah. he just loses <laughs> his shit. And it took me a second to realize it. But like, he's talking about invading Russia. And it didn't work. Like so, so it it was such a bad plan that Hitler tried it and also failed. Like, like it's such a and, and it's and I was just dying laughing and and yeah, I had to like stop it and just let it all out and then keep going because I, it was so funny. And then yeah, they, they knew it, enough to know what they could break. It's it's like the old, oh yeah. it's like the Jim Lee quote about being an artist. It's like you have to know the law, know the rules before you can break them. Yeah. Of well, in the other Napoleon joke about the ice cream, it kind of took me like it didn't hit me right away that because I thought Napoleon was like a cake of some kind, but I think it's a little bit more <laughs> ice cream based. And also Ed Solomon does know that he read some book somewhere that where I saw it listed that Ed Solomon's like, oh, yeah, we read a book somewhere that and I thought it was weird that Napoleon liked ice cream. And so, like, it's kind of historically accurate that he's really going ape shit over the ice cream. And I was like, the hell? <laughs> like, and that's back then where there was no internet. Like, you had to legit, like, just randomly stumble upon facts or do hard research by reading books. Like, all the books, not just, like, you know, buying a digital copy of the book and then just quickly going control F and typing Napoleon or well, ice cream or not whatever. Not to mention, I mean... Napoleon's having a weird day. I mean, and suddenly there's ice cream in front of him. It's familiar. It's comforting. <laughs> Why not be a Ziggy Piggy? <laughs> ziggy Piggy. He's going bowling? Yeah. Unsuccessfully? Yeah. I mean, he's cheating at bowling. Well, right down the aisle? That was another thing. Like, the only problem is that anytime I see any bowling scene in TV or movie, I instantly think of the dude and Walter Market Zero dude. Like, like, but it's, but still, it was so good of him just like, one looking around like my turn move yeah it was yeah so as much as i have that weird again i think i was kind of soiled by my my watching partner on those first two maybe that is the other reason why but but no i the robots in bogus journey was such a weird like i remember them but i don't like i don't remember them doing the good versions of them like oh yeah like I remember the evil ones yeah. because I remember they took off their heads and were playing basketball with it. And man, and the, also I forgot that George Carlin's Rufus was okay. Who was the, the lady that ran the show? What was the actor's name? Was that the girl who was in Jackie Brown or was that Tina, Tina Turner? I can't remember. In, in the second but, one in bogus journey. Yeah. She played the, uh, the girl who ran the event and she like zips down and reveals that she's actually, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. You are correct. That was Jackie Brown. Damn Jackie it. Brown. I'm blank. Okay. Mother. Thank Pam you. Yes. Greer. Yes. <laughs> Cause of the hair, the way the hair was, it was like, Oh, that's Tina Turner. And then when I saw her again at the end, I was like, that ain't Tina Turner. Nah, she's doing is Tina Turner Jackie riff. Brown? Is that Jackie Brown? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That, I thought that was such a weird. Okay. Also, they broke the I didn't understand the laws of time travel and bogus journey where I mean, I do and I don't where they're just like in the final bow. They're like, Ted, we can go back and say, put give him a gun that has like the little bang thing in it. Yeah. But then the bad guy uses it against him, too. And then I get confused at how the bad guy does it. They're both able to go back and set things up because they both knew time travel. OK, but doesn't that. OK, so. I think it's that since they won, the guy didn't, but they set the stuff up for him so that it would look like he did. Okay. Because they said, yeah, we went back and reset the key. And then, like, he shot the gun and, like, the bang, you know, the little sign came out. 
And they were like, yeah, because we won. We set those things up. Okay, I must have missed that thing because that was I was just like, wait, my time travel brain is I know we're all used to how time travel works in an Avenger world, but we're not used to like classic movies doing that kind of shit. Okay, the one time it didn't break my brain because it usually does. Because yeah. if I think about it, like in the Marvel movies, I'm like, uh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, my brain's it, gonna go. Let's so, be honest, it broke everybody's brain in the event. That, that, that is though, my one question, and I, I'm assuming this is, is is the rule. But in the first one, time travel, the, the clock in San Dimas is always moving, never changes. Yeah. And in the second one, they're able to go to the future and come back. So does the San Dimas clock not move in the future, only the past? It just move in their time? Yeah, that's... That's, that's how it is in the first one, right? Right, but in the second one, they go... They much. Right, but in the second one, they do go to the future and have children and come back. That is true. It that's, just reminded me, has anyone watched Dragon Ball Z? I, I watched it up to the Frieza saga, and then... Then you I'm, won't know what I'm talking about, never mind. <laughs> But there's like a room they can go into wait, wait, wait for a, a year and only a day passes. Wait a minute, isn't that the isn't that the room that's like with uh their trainer up in like heaven? Yeah. Like, yeah, like go That's what my brain associated it with is like, oh yeah, they just were in that room. It's fine. I got you. Okay. I just watched Nutcracker mm-hmm. and the Four Realms, and the Nutcracker realm is like that. Like if you're in there. Like time moves fast, but if you can watch like the outside and the outside, like the real world time moves really slow. You're on the Matthew McConaughey planet from uh, Interstellar. Except you're the guy who's on the, if you're in the room, you're the guy who's on the spaceship. Yep. But I do love that. I can't remember anyone else who watched like all three of them recently. I, I do like the retcon of Bill Jr. and Ted Jr. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. being daughters yeah when i so i watched him in order and when they came back like i i remember they rocked out to that song at, at the end credits which is uh god gave rock and roll to you like i yeah. remember that but i don't remember that they came out looking like led zeppelin yeah. a little bit <laughs> like heavy metal red led zeppelin or at least alex winter did and yeah and then they I, and i completely forgot that the kids were strapped to the back and they said little bill and little ted or ted jr i was like oh okay this is weird now and that yeah i did like that when i watched face the music they did like a nice little quick recon of like i don't know why they called you that or because it was charming dude or whatever it was yeah yeah it was a nice save Honestly, I, also, I like the recast as well of the princesses. There's a part of me that's a little bummed, but at the same time, they kind of didn't keep the same girls in Bogus Journey, I don't think, or like one no, of them. I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, they have been. So, honestly, and also, like, anytime you can give me some Aaron Hayes, I'm happy. Oh, she's the, the redhead. I guess she might have, she's more of the brunette. Came- yeah, she was from uh, Children's Hospital. Oh, okay. The fact that they didn't really time travel at all not really yeah it was just they went to at the they, very really, end yeah they only go to right. the future at the very end everything else is uh heaven which looks like the future and then hell which looks like album covers y- yes which yeah. was really and just like the nether world of them as ghosts but wait i it took me a second to but did anyone notice that that wasn't like they were painted uh, gray screen or gray tones and not actually colored over digitally? Like it was makeup. I did not notice that. I did not notice that. No, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, I liked how they were like, like not just like their, you know, faces like painted, but like everything, like their clothes suddenly were, you know, gray scale and not, colored even though they wear color you know in the real world oh yeah i well because i thought so that's the thing that sometimes like if sometimes if i'm impressed by something my like how do they do it brain kicks in and even if it's for a second and luckily it's mostly them going whoa dude and then they got to walk back so it's like a shot of them walking so i had plenty (laughs) of time of my brain just to wander and go how do they do that and then the next scene it looked like i was like oh my god that's makeup because it looked like when Ted like does like when they both do that, like you can kind of see it's kind of fading by the shirts. But I was like, holy shit, that means it's gray shirts. That way, like that's all 
you know, bravo to them on that, man, because it looks really good. It holds up really well. The makeup in general through all of them was good. I mean, look at all the different Bill and Ted's in the third one, which oh, I mean, initially when I saw the previews, I thought they were going to be jumping multiverse. I didn't realize it was going to be, which they, they ended up doing, but I thought it was going to be not two parallel timelines. Yeah. Which it ended up being, but I thought, but the makeup on Bill and Ted at each session, like when Ted takes off his girdle and lets his gut out. Yeah. And then he does the whole plays with it for a little (laughs) bit. Like, Oh no. I mean, like the, the, that them is like the huge buff guys. Oh, oh, what? Oh, and I will say when I watched the first one, I didn't or watch face the music the first time I didn't have subtitles on. Okay. And I forget what show we were watching. We turn I think some English show. We turned subtitles on. We've never taken them off since then. So for the last month, two months, and so I I finally could understand what the hell the song they were singing when Bill and Ted arrive in the prison. But it's like death, pain, suffering. And I'm just going like, oh my god! Like <laughs> like it actually made it really funny. Like even more funny and weird that the like the our version of Bill and Ted that we're traveling with has not really. That I think that's a Rob Stein song. Oh, is it? Oh, really? isn't it? The problem is, it sounds like one to me. <laughs> what like, what do you think of our song? I don't know. It's kind of dark. <laughs> yeah. And can we also point out the first time I've ever been? So there are two times I've been surprised about a gag in a movie or a TV show, and one of them was I at least got to throw it out there for any Looney Tunes fans: the new Looney Tunes Wile E. Coyote. He, it's only and, and literally it's the whole it's like a short it's not even a full short it's like literally like a minute long is he paints a wall over the, a rock makes it look like a roadway the roadrunner runs in it like he do but then the coyote gets confused and goes over and touches it but this time he can go into it and then when he turns around the roadrunner comes go circles back around and beeps at him so then he tries to leave the rock and he gets stuck in the rock. <laughs> and so then Roadrunner takes a, a water hose and washes them off. And then him and the paint just oozes down. Like that was such a pleasing gag because I feel like Roadrunner, it's like Tom and Jerry. It, it, you've done it all. It's we don't need more. I can watch more. I don't need it. The gag of like, how are we not going to allow ourselves to know what we're going to do is they put the buckets on their heads and just wander around the Dave Grohl's <laughs> mansion. Like both times I watched it, like it was, it's that was another pause. I got to laugh because it's so smart and how dumb it is. Oh yeah. It's classic, <laughs> stupid, smart. And I, I think it hit even more now that I knew that in retrospect, I knew it was coming up, but I, there was, it, I think the line that Bill says beforehand, he's like, Oh no, I know what he's going to do. He's going to do that. And it's just like, it even hit even more. So before you see them and then that's why it's funny. Like it, it, it works in a completely different way as well. <laughs> so it's, yeah. It, it, and you know, on that, there were so many good guest stars. I thought in this one, Beck Bennett, I thought what was really well used, but Holy shit. No ho Hank. Wait a minute, who? No ho Hank, but Anthony Kerrigan. Have you seen Barry? Oh, 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 I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he played uh, Dennis McCoy. Yeah. Den- yeah it's like, no ho name, Hank. My name is Dennis McCoy. Da, da, da. I feel really <laughs> bad. Like, we get it. Yeah. Dennis, the, the first time he killed someone and then just like realized he killed the wrong person and kind of just like slipped away. That was the moment when I lost it. I think so. I think it's that same scene, is it not? The the bucket scene is that the first time? Yeah, he kills yeah, it is because that's what uh, he shoots he, his his dad of yeah. all people. <laughs> like, when he shoots like Ted's dad in the van, I was like, "What the fuck?" Oh my god! And, <laughs> and I, the I, look I, on his face when he realized he screwed up and just kind of like backed away. Right, <laughs> and then but like, like they're still monitoring him, so they can see that he killed the wrong person, which even <laughs> made it even more like oh like what are you doing (laughs) like it was yeah i i also yeah i mean it 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 even lands harder the second time you're watching it and you know he does it but then he also kills everybody else (laughs) and then then the delay gets even worse of him going sorry (laughs) sorry yeah and i also like too it's like mom i don't believe 
you you may you named him after my ex boyfriend, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. Which, which I, you know, she was so good as always, Kristen, Kristen Shaw, Shaw as the Rufus replacement. Because that was something coming into this one, I was like, I was kind of concerned. What are you gonna do about Rufus? And I thought the little moment with the hologram of him was, was perfect. So when I saw that being, maybe it's because I saw the first two, like right before rewatching the third one again, I, it was, I don't, I didn't see anything in the credits. Was that like an impersonation of George Carlin that they digitally? I think it's old footage, isn't it? Cause it just feels weird because I, in retrospect of watching it, I forget what the line is, but it's something like, it almost felt like it was cut from an alternate introduction to the movie or something like that. Or, well, no, the yeah. first movie does open up with him talking to the audience kind of and saying, you know what, never mind. I, okay, I just answered my own question. I guess I watched one like Excellent Adventure like two days and then I watched Bogus Journey and Face the Music kind of like back to back. So I just, that's weird. Okay, never mind. I That makes sense to me because I was wondering like, I don't remember where that scene would have possibly been from old footage or something. So then I, in my head, brain cannon made it up like, oh, it's a deleted scene or an alternate something, but. But yeah, no, George Carlin was he was missed, but he they did a good job of filling that void with Kristen Shaw. So I just looked it up because we don't need mystery. It is archival footage and they got an animation voiceover artist to fill in spots. Okay. Pietor Michael, Pietor Michelle. I don't know. That I mean, can I gotta say that, that guy did a really good job. Like I could not tell. Yeah. It was, I mean, the image, I guess, was, a, you know, could have been manipulated, but I, I, the voice just didn't sound like at all manipulated, which that's impressive, man. Yeah, that's super impressive. Yeah. But um, they, just, they wanted to do that rather than go CGI. They wanted to use archival footage. Something that I was thinking of, and I don't think it's bad, by the way. I want to. I, I didn't really think this the first time, but watching the second time, did anyone feel like they kind of did a Force Awakens approach to with Face the Music, where they kind of remade a quicker version of Excellent Adventure, but with the girls, while the boys were doing, you know, the dads were doing their own thing? Yeah, like collecting people and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't, it, I don't know why it didn't hit me the first time, but like I was like, maybe because the first one was a little bit more present in my brain. And I don't have a problem with it. I thought I enjoyed it a great deal and I loved all the different people they got. You think about it, they actually, I, I viewed it as more than them doing an homage to the, their adventures, the fact that they basically got to do Bill and Ted and Bogus Journey on one trip. The two, Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't even, now you say, yeah. I didn't even think about bogus. So Street. to me, it was How them much? basically completely following in their father's footsteps and succeeding at the end because of everything that they have been through and they've been prepared for. So did you guys tear up at the end of Face the Music? I did. Yeah. I cry at Hallmark card commercials, though, I, you know. There's a true story. I told Becky a story about Donald Duck one time, and she started crying. I felt yeah. instantly bad because I wasn't true trying story. to make her cry. But I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, I got to tell you this sad thing that it's, like, touching. And it was, like, too touching. <laughs> I felt no. really bad afterwards. So, no, don't I, feel bad. I cry at the drop of a hat. It, it is I, what it is. I, I, as I said earlier, I also I watched this on my 42nd birthday, and for it to be a movie about men going through – like their middle age and they're th in questioning their legacy and what they've done with their life. It, it, it did definitely. I was like, Oh God, that did not expect this to be a poignant movie to watch on my birthday. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. And during a year where like, we can't really do anything. I mean, yeah, we can, but you know, frankly, most of the time I'm working or which I'm lucky in that I am working, but yeah. you know, I'm working or I'm anxietying. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, you, Jess? Did it did it get you in the feels or I did not tear up, but it did I was touched. And I will say, like when we it's not the ending I wanted, but they won me over with it. Yeah. So by the end I was like, Yeah, okay, I like it. I feel like Jess, that's kind of something that I felt early on where it's the first time they said something about was it Logan and Preston instead of saying their specific names? I go, Oh, the daughters are going to do it. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, you know, 15 minutes in or something, or I was yeah. like, 
oh, I know how this is going to end. Yeah. But luckily it did. It was still an enjoyable ride to get me there. Yeah. What I, I tell you what I love though, I think probably my favorite thing was just the whole setup in the beginning about the fact of how much it would completely fuck you up to be told you're going to write the song that's going to unite all of humanity. Go. No pressure. Yeah. I, the the missed expectate like the expectations the pressure like the forced legacy onto someone mm-hmm. and, and just kind of one of those things where you, you have to ask you know kind of bring up the fact that is that why they were never able to do it and their kids were because they were never that pressure was never put on their kids their kids were always said like they were in music cool do whatever you want to do they were good parents to their kids and their kids ended up being the ones to save everything well, and I think that's something too that I was actually glad I got when I rewatched the first two was the relationship between the parents, the parental units. Bill's uh, well, step Missy <laughs> didn't seem to really she kind of cared, but it was like a weird, like possibly, I guess, in retrospect, incestuous thing. But like came to their presentation, Nick. Yeah. You gotta yeah, care yeah. about your child to do that. <laughs> no, no, well, no, it was other stuff. Like, there's some. How much like, do I love the fact when she goes to the presentation, their teacher gives her like the side eye? Yeah. That little God, I love that. Yeah, it's. But you know the fact that he has that weird relationship with his like to me, I thought that was it was funny, but it it was I felt like I think it was just as creepy then as it was now, where it's like Bill got kicked out of his own room. So his dad yeah. can fuck his wife, who is four years older than him. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think in the first one, it said he asked, yeah, who was his almost prom date. The yeah. hell. Ew. You know it, what I mean? It, yeah. We're freshmen and she was a senior. Is that what they said? Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, like yeah. yeah. Because that was the thing is that it's like Ted's little like jib at him when they're like talking about, we got to pass this history test, dude. And he's like, maybe we can get a ride. Oh, there's your hot stepmom. It's like, shut up, Ted. And he's like, remember I almost asked her out? Didn't you ask her out for prom or whatever? And he's like, shut up, Ted. Yeah, it's really, it's the only well, time that they get it, kind of in eh, with each other. And, you know, that is kind of like one of those things, too, that is, is, is an interesting thing is the fact that they had such bad relationships with their parents. Right. And their kids did, did not. Their kids were loved and accepted. And they went on to be successful. I, I, for, I, I cried for me uh, even the second time. I, and I, I, I figured out the moment it was is when they get up on stage again, and it's like they've already passed the torch. Like they don't need to be there to do anything. Their kids are doing. Yeah. It. I, I, I felt like it was a nice little moment of they let the daughters do their thing, and then the daughters are also reaching back out to them. You know what I mean? It's a it weird... weren't like Lindsay Lohan's mom. Yeah, it was just a it was such a weird little moment and it was very fleeting. And I think that I don't know why it hit me in the feels. Like maybe it's because I feel like I'm getting up in years two and I, you know, I don't know. I I don't know. I feel like it's all kind of in some weird headspace in there. But uh, like... it and I think that's where especially like this third one, it does hit a lot of those subtle notes. Yeah. That it, I don't know if like it, it maybe it wasn't able to as much for the first two, but also they weren't trying to be subtle because Bill and Ted weren't subtle at that point. They hadn't learned subtlety. Yeah. Um, we haven't learned them learning subtlety. So it's a very different, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I could handle them learning subtlety necessarily. Yeah. I mean, there were some subtle things they picked up or they didn't pick up on, but we're aware of in Bogus Dream in terms of the, the, the girls, like the princesses, yeah. the babes, as they call them. But even... That is actually something I really liked about the third one is that when they realized their relationships were in jeopardy, nothing else mattered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They legitimately cared for their wives. They legitimately wanted to save those relationships. And they even like went directly to them instead of the sitcom thing. Like they went to them right away and like, Hey, we know we screwed this up. We're going to make it better. Don't, you know, you know, whole kind of thing. But, but then they made it was it worse. The, yeah the, the it further worse, the further we? they went down the road of trying to make it better they made it worse but they were actually legitimately concerned about yeah. the wives and I think too it, it boils down to their attitude for their family it all comes down to in a more succinct line of just how what Keanu Reeves is like 
we're not here for us. It's not us. What can we do for you? Like it's you. Yeah. And I feel it's, that's how they kind of feel about both of them, the, the kids and the wives. And it's refreshing. And especially because of 2020 and we have a horrible human being as president, not, not yeah. long as when we're, when we're recording this, not long, you are correct. But I, I feel like it's another reason why I think like if you guys, I, I know Eric has, but if like you two haven't seen Ted Lasso, it's kind of the same reason. It's like, right there man it, it hits you right there because yeah i don't want to say anything because i'd like to talk about it on the podcast but i don't i want other people to see it before i yeah, i don't, yeah. don't want to spoil anything but yeah it kind of hits you in the same way like this is I like actually, the thing i, needed I actually right watched now. ted lasso election night rather than watch any of the election coverage you're a smart man i i i had some adult spirits and just turned everything off and uh just wa- binge the entire season of ted lasso I, I just, oh, see, I don't watch any of that stuff in general, but I would check Twitter. So I would know what the hell was going. Unfortunately, yeah. I knew what was going on. It was well, the worst. I, 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 you know what, we I were knew, watching the returns come in. So I, I knew what it was going to be that night. And I knew it was going to do me no good to watch it <laughs> because I we knew, knew it was that gonna, too. And, and yet, oh, and yet yeah. we still, that's the thing we kept saying in this house is like, you know, the results are not going to be in until probably like maybe even Sunday or Tuesday of next week. On like maybe because so, it's going to come down to one or two states. But it was Saturday because we were wa- we yeah. watched MSNBC the whole day on Saturday. Like the results came in, they called it. We're like, yeah. Look, Nick, we, I had we to know hiking. just how disappointed I had to be in my fellow man. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we went and that's hiking. That's why I watched. <laughs> we came. We came out of. Oh, I, I yeah. mean, I know people are terrible. We I, actually went hiking <laughs> when there was no cell service on Saturday and came out of the out of the forest to the news that it had been called. But I. I need yeah, to I know the disappointment after, in human beings. I worked the night before, mm-hmm. woke up, and it's the first thing I saw. And I was like, oh. I was, I can't remember what I was watching. I was probably just watching the weekend today show because that's what I do on Saturday mornings. I do that and I look at recipes. I said, Nick, cut, uh, cut this little snippet out here. Okay. That Ashley is from Michigan. So we had a secured supplies. So I, I had I had myself a nice old brownie right before, right after dinner that night. Nice. Yeah. I, you know, I think I need to do, yeah, this is, this will all be cut out. I just need to say, yeah. I need to think, I need, think I need to do an edible because the one time I, I think the last major thing I went to, I think it was the Halloween party last year at Laura's. I, I finally tried a, a, a puff and, or actually I tried more than a few. And like the goggles, they did nothing. I just did like, I don't know if it's because I drank a little bit. Like I was not super buzzed. I was a little buzzed uh, from alcohol and I didn't feel the other buzz. And I was kind of, I was like, this is depressing. I, I had asthma as a child. So I was never, ever able to do anything like that. And I never wanted to try just some sketchy random person stuff. So once uh, it, became legal in Michigan and we have to drive back and forth. Nice. Might as well make that drive extra worth your while. Eric, that you want to be the spokesman for Michigan and you know, <laughs> fire Tim Allen from another job that he doesn't really need. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> they deserve it right now. I mean, fuck that guy. Well, so here's the other thing too. Tim Allen's going to be in that movie. I, this is the thing because the movie's Woman. probably going to end with yeah yeah because he's he, the real man is being turned into a toy and to a cartoon show that uh, wait yeah, what? that's why yeah the that's light why, year cartoon is that what you're talking about buzz light your origin movie yeah so they, what i've always wanted <laughs> they, I, like the one thing okay like pete doctor's running thing and he has a good like story head on his shoulders but i kind of feel like Disney's just like, yeah, you can do your Pixar shit, but we want like four sequels to shit. Give us something. And so Buzz Lightyear is based after a real man and go. And it's like, we'll cast Chris Evans. Brilliant. And of course, like Tim Allen is like pissed off. And even I was just like, they're not going to use Tim Allen. Okay. But then after I thought, I was like, he's going to come back in the movie because the movie will probably end with him being turned into a toy. Yep. Like, See, you know what I mean? Like he's a hero. See, Tim, Tim Allen is actually meeting Tim Allen on Last Man Standing. Oh, fuck that shit. No. He's meeting to Tim Taylor. Who is? Mm. Wow. That's 
Yes, they are crossing over they last cross man over. standing with home improvements. So uh, last man standing at is Kansas. anyone else? Uh, I think Richard Kind or not Richard Kind, Richard Carlin, Rich, Richard something, the guy who Carnes. plays Al. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Barnes, Carnes. Is I know Carnes is Republican, but everyone else was kind of hardcore liberal Democrat. Mm-hmm. Is anyone else from? Because I think the shot I saw of that, they're in Tim's house. They're not the one kid. Okay, so here's a completely random thing. The one kid did, got arrested for, I believe, domestic abuse. Yeah, that was recent. Very recent. And yeah. so yeah. here's the best thing about it. The middle one, if yeah. you look at his Instagram announcement of their separating, he word for word copied another more famous celebrity's Instagram announcement of his divorce and just changed the names. It is amazing. I think he shot. Now, wasn't he just in the news for like domestic violence? All I know is he plagiarizes like everything he does. (laughs) Oh, Shia LaBeouf? Yeah. Army Hammers. I didn't know that. Improvement star removes Instagram post of split with wife after plagiarism allegations. He deleted a post on social media announcing his divorce from his wife, and it was revealed he copied actor Army Hammer's announcement word for word. He then deleted his entire Instagram. Can I just say I didn't know Army Hammer was married? I didn't, but I can still look at his face, Nick. No, there's nothing wrong with Army Hey. Army Hammer is a very attractive man. He, also, there's nothing wrong with divorce. It's wonderful. That, <laughs> also, it's also good for people who need it. So yes. I, I'm not knocking it. I just think it's more like. You could ar- like write your own separation announcement. Well, when I think of Army Hammer, I think of him as a charming, like good looking guy. But that's all, and an actor. And that's all I know about him. I would not sit there and say poetic Instagrammer that I would want to copy his whatever about divorce. I, I just feel like it's a very like there's left field and then there's like not even in the same ballpark. Like, like that's like, that's that, you know, like if Kim Kardashian, someone way more public, I, I feel like it was way more whatever. And they are not Kim, but like someone else announced they're di- oh, like Chris Pratt or like, you know, what's her name? His ex and Anna Fair thing. It's Anna. I it? said it wrong. Yeah. I don't remember. Right as I said it, I completely felt really bad. It's Anna. Anna, like their whole thing of what they said was, uh, you know, take out the part about the kid. That would make more sense to me. But I mean, Hammer, it's just such a weird. By the way, for yeah. the record, I enjoyed Lone Ranger. It's not bad. And for the record, uh, Man from Uncle is fucking perfect. I don't know about perfect, but I enjoyed the shit out of it. And I wanted there to be like three sequels. For what it is, it is fucking perfect. Okay, I'll go with that. I agree with that. Yeah. Anyway, because this has all been cut. I'm sorry, Jess, what's up? Oh, I was going to say, I want to talk about the music and Bill and Ted face the music. Okay. All right. Because we're this whole thing. That's a good segue. Yeah. Hold on. This whole thing has to be cut. Let's give Jessica a really good. I'm going to go. I'm just going to count down to to zero. And -hmm. you can just say, I want to talk about the music. All right, because I mean, we have to cut out everything about even Buzz Lightyear, which I thought was interesting, but there, I don't. There's no way to leave that in and have it make no, sense. Not it's at all. like we're talking, and it's like Buzz Lightyear movie. All right, sorry. So I want to talk about the music. Okay. Nice. I thought this movie had. I mean, obviously there was the final song, which was I liked a lot, but yeah. my favorite moment was when Mozart's playing and Jimi Hendrix starts playing out in the parking lot, basically (laughs) to be like, you know, like (laughs) I can play your song on guitar. And instead of everybody being like, what is that sound that I've never heard in my life, which is an electric guitar. They just, you know, sit there and keep listening. And then Mozart gets pissed and comes out and I'm like, but it like the music was great. So legit question. Is he pissed? Cause he looks pissed, but also like happy. It's He's German. To... Oh, yeah. Uh... Austrian. Yeah, okay. He you won me over with your argument. He had emotions. He, he did, had... yeah. Probably multiple, but like he was supposed to be the prodigy. Like, how dare somebody come and play his music and I get more heard. attention than him? <laughs> Can I also say a missed opportunity is that apparently Mozart had a horrible, like, god awful laugh, like a hyena. And 
I feel like that was completely <laughs> missed out at some point. I, I and it's such a simple joke. You, you don't you don't understand what the fuck he's saying anyway. Just have him laugh. Also, he really liked the lady who played the drums. The yeah. The girl from Africa, which I just again like, he was like he's the one that went after her when everyone's like, "Oh, she's running away." We kind of scared her, and he's like, no, 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 come back!" Like he's the only one. Like, guys, leave Mozart out to dry. Come on now. I liked with that the fact that they like was it. If I have the wrong thing backwards, I apologize. When they showed like Jimi Hendrix, like uh, I think it was or maybe it was the, the cell phone video, cell phone video. It's like. What is this? <laughs> like, it's just, his reaction. <laughs> well, I loved his reaction. It, right? It's a weird thing. Like the second time I watched it, it felt even like, man, he's going for that impersonation so much. It's like a little bit over the top. And then he, he also pulls it back. It's like a weird dance he does. And the, the one that pushes it over for me is the him of, of him looking at the phone going, oh, man, what is this crazy thing or whatever? And you're just yeah. Like, <laughs> Man, you're I, really going for that accent. You're going for that impersonation, bro. Okay. I, I enjoyed it in that moment, but yes, I agree. Oh, yo, totally. <laughs> it's a great moment, and it. And here's the thing. He probably really would say that, but, oh, like, yeah. I don't know. It's such a weird – but, no, I just – I, too, love that scene. And, actually, I love the final – there's actually kind of two songs they kind of play, I feel like, in the credits. It's the one song that they start the end – you know, they save the world with, and I think it's the Weezer song, too. Like, it feeds into that, and yeah. I like both of those. Like – Mm-hmm. the music it helps too that rock and roll is a little bit more mellow now than it was like usually rock and roll to me nowadays like actual rock and roll was like you know the, what's that german band you mentioned eric like hammerstein or whatever romstein romstein mm-hmm. that to me is what i consider now like current rock and roll like actual rock and roll like you can still rock but like remember the beatles was rock and roll like paul mccartney doing pop songs like granny music as yeah. john would say like I which grand I like granny music. The soundtrack for Face the Music was a little bit more in my wheelhouse than watching <laughs> Excellent Adventure and Bogus Journey. Though oh, I man. did get Faith more. No, I, I was a big Faith No More fan at the time. Come on now. Oh, oh, hey, no, I'm not knocking it. I'm just Sir saying, James like, Martin. Yeah, but they also like seemed to be implying that the wedding song was not good. I loved the wedding song. It was. I thought it was. Really I, I love. I love the girls' love reaction the as well. It's like that. Da- Dad's getting really good at that. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. And so, like, I thought that yeah, like it's. I think it sounds really like it's weird to play at a wedding, but I actually really liked it. I love so when they announced the name of that song. That was probably the first laugh for me in the movie. The first oh, like, yeah. I mean, it was early, so it makes sense. But when they're like. Our, the next song we're going to play is <laughs> like the, and they gave it some hugely pretentious title. Oh yeah, I just well, loved in three parts or whatever yeah. it was. Could it is like like to circle back to earlier where, I mean, they were told as teenagers that they're going to write the song that's going to save the world, and yeah. like how, like you can see like where they're they're, how do you do that? Like that's. So much pressure. Yeah. Oh, right. Like how I don't even. So you probably don't write a title that's pretentious. You write pretty much like "Peace is Everything" or something just really quick like that. It's a. Oh, I did message. thirty years ago. And thirty years ago, right? And yeah. then, but but it's not working. You haven't. Right. So then you yet. you've got to get crazier and weirder and like more out there and like. Yeah. Mash your sounds together. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. him bringing out yeah. the only thing you have to be to unite the world is Michael Jackson. Until he, he touched a lot of people. I've never been- I, I will say, too, the thing about the daughter's reaction, too, was they were all, it was twofold. And the first time I only caught the, the, the this part, which is they're like, oh, you guys shouldn't be playing it. But this time around, I watched, we're like, oh, that's really good. But you kind of, sh- this is not the place for that. Like, it was like a, they gave both emotions and it, and the first time I only caught the one that even we're thinking, which is like, why are you guys doing this at a wedding? But it was nice to see that both girls were genuinely impressed. It just wasn't a line that came in later. Like we were genuinely impressed with your throat singing dad. Like, and, and I will say too, that I want to go back to one of the musicians here in a minute, but before we do, since we're talking about the daughters, Samantha weaving is so next level in everything right now. Yeah. I mm-hmm. have absolutely I loved her last like four performances. I didn't realize that she's what Hugo Weaving's niece. 
I think it's his daughter or niece or something like that. Yeah, no, it's but oh, it's his niece. But Shit. oh my god, mm-hmm. is she good? I mean, just everything I've seen her in so far, I've just been so entertained, and they've all been different enough. You know, like I mean, it, it is kind of you know, oh no, first world problem to get you know get the hot girl role but like she has played them all so differently between like the babysitter what babysitter two ready or not this yeah. and i want i know there's another one in there that i've seen her in recently too Wait, where she's it's just the, the bride and ready or not yeah holy shit yeah. yeah that's her yeah yeah did not how great it's one of those things where it's like she is so she's a star in my opinion I watched, have you guys seen Atypical on Netflix? I have not. So we watched that. It The girl who plays Ted's daughter, she's in that. And she plays the exact opposite of how she does in Face the Music. And she's also really good, too. I was very surprised. Like, yeah, they were both fantastic. I loved both of them equally. Like, I thought they were really And you know, they had to do a thing where they had to basically play somewhat of a female version of their fathers, but as their own characters. Yeah. That's weird. yeah. And, and even too, like that's something I think when you think about it, like, you know, Bill and Ted are having to play the, their own, the same characters 20 some years later. Yeah. And to make it realize that this is the same character, but they have evolved and there is something else to it. Like, you know, Keanu's bringing some real weariness to Ted, but yet still that positive, kind of stuff but there's he's bringing this different edge to it which i really enjoyed well also too maybe it's because i rewatched him recently i kind of feel like in the first two movies ted was the little bit more slower on the cusp kind of guy while bill was smarter because bill was the one that was like ted no we need to pass history like he's like i think he corrected ted on like a history question about i i think it during the first movie and the second one he was talking about the girls and correcting ted on that and in this one, it's Ted who's just like, I can't do this anymore, dude. I'm I'm tired. Uh, and yeah. you can see it on his face. And yeah, I will say the funny comment from my wife is Keanu Reeves does not look good at this age. And my response to that was like, yes, but he's not. He doesn't have facial hair. Mm-hmm. He has facial hair. He looks damn good. It, he but looks it, better with facial hair. I, I think it's a weird thing, but he does look more exhausted and tired than the movie. But I've also can't tell you the last time I've seen him with his hair down long and clean shaven. Yeah. And it adds to that weird, I don't know, of older Ted being really tired. <laughs> but so the, the other character, and this is what I wanted to get back to with the music. Yeah. That I don't know if anyone else ever watched comedy Bang Bang on IFC. Occasionally. Which was the TV show inspired by the podcast <laughs> it's probably the best way to say it but the second musical host on it after uh reggie left to go do the show with uh, james gordon was was kid cuddy and i swear to god kid cuddy is basically playing his dj character from that where he was basically constantly like explaining things to scott and like would know all these diff weird different riffs that he would go on as like this like music nerd. So like him just like randomly knowing multiverse theory yeah. and stuff. <laughs> so, it just took me right back to the fact that like, they picked him right off a of comedy bang. Cause I was like, man, he's got good comedy chops when he was on that show, which I hadn't I had fully no, expected. I had no idea who Kid Cudi was. And I didn't, it was one of those things where I didn't research him. I thought he was a legit rapper. He is. Oh, oh, he, oh okay. Oh yeah. Man I, on the moon three just came out this last week. Oh, uh, see, no clue. I took it as legitimate as that you, which plays against our expectations that we don't expect a rapper to be, you know, spouting off, uh, you know, hypotheses about time travel and quantum physics and all this and that. And I also can I also say I appreciate Ted being honest enough to tell someone to his face, like, could you please just tell us what you want us to do? <laughs> like, he's not saying he doesn't say the normal line of, can you please explain it to me like I'm five? He's like, can you just please tell us what you want us to do? He's like, go to the phone booth, man, or whatever it is. And he's just which like, I think brings in like, like that weariness and that like change of how like Ted has grown, yeah. and the fact that maybe in the first or second you're like, yeah, totally, dude. What? Yeah. <laughs> it's like oh as opposed to now, it's just like, 
look, just tell me. <laughs> and I think in 2020, we can all appreciate that. I think yeah, everybody's that's... tired and weary and just like, no, I'm done. And I, I think there's something in that that this year in particular, everybody can relate to. Yeah. yeah. For some reason, you saying that made me think of a line that I actually, even the second time, I'm, I loved it even more because you don't hear it in movies. I At least I don't feel so, or I haven't heard it in a long time that I can remember it off the top of my head, is when the universe is starting to go crash and burn because Bill and Ted haven't done the song or they haven't found who's doing the song yet. And they cut back to Rufus's wife. And they're like, minister whatever we got a supreme leader we need to leave it's like where are we gonna go <laughs> like yeah that's such a, like such a great response because it's so true it's like because i maybe i feel like it's an old memory of one of the superman cartoons or movies but it's like krypton's blowing up they put clark in the ship and he goes away it's like we got to get out of here like where are you fucking going you can't fly here you don't have time to get into the ship you did since you brought up Rufus's <laughs> wife, I thought the movie did such a, an interesting thing with that and the fact that yeah. she, they actually played her as a leader having to make hard choices and decisions based upon the survival of, of everything, where she was not some cartoon villain that set out to kill Bill and Ted. You know, like like essentially the second one. It It was one of those things of, she had to make a hard decision on sacrificing Bill and Ted to save the universe. Yeah. And it didn't play her as evil. It actually let her still be a good person making that decision. That's true. Yeah, that's a hundred percent trick. I, I think that's the, I think maybe that's the thing of why I just, in retrospect, like if for any of you out there that are grew up watching Bill and Ted and you have like a significant other you want to introduce to the movies, <laughs> maybe just do face the music because I feel like the gentleness of those characters and yeah, it gets a little silly, but like still just like the first two did, but it, I don't know, it feels more grounded and it feels more like, like that, that it's a, another point is that, yeah, like even her, she's the antagonist of the film but she's really not. She's just trying to do the right thing to save yeah. the universe because obviously Bill and Ted aren't doing it. And maybe my husband was wrong with the prophecy and that kind of sucks. But yeah, it, it's even crazy. Dennis isn't a bad guy. He's just doing this job <laughs> poorly. Dennis, Dennis. Um, and apologizing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm what, sorry. What did Bill say to him in the van or no, when they get to hell and he just tells him to shut up. Like he's telling him, he's like, we get it. <laughs> But he says, like, it's like a word that Bill, I feel like, should not know. And he's like, get it. You're like, he's, what is that? Jesus, it's going to bother me. But pretty much he's just telling us, like, we get it. You're, like, really sympathetic or whatever. But it's not even that. It's another word that means that. I can't think of it. But, like, I feel like it was a word that. Yeah. (laughs) I could see, the, but at the same point, I could see Bill and Ted being those guys who know a handful of $6 words. Oh, that's true. Like they might know fifteen big words. They had a word of the day calendar, and they did it for like two weeks, and and then they just kind of lost track of it. Also, randomly, did anyone if when if you guys rewatched the first two, did any of you had problems remembering that heinous is not a uh, bad thing? If you say it's heinous, like it means it's actually a good, cool thing, like it's sick. So like, well, it, it, you know, it depends on context clues. Well, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it took me a second because in the first movie, they say something's heinous. And I was like, I thought that was, oh, wait, I get it. Okay, yeah. But it took me a second. And then it threw me off more because they they do wordplay with that in Bogus Journey, which is like, that is not cool how they treated us, Ted. That is the most non-heinous thing that I'm like, wait. Okay, yeah, okay, I got it. Like, yeah, it took me a second. Like, to I forgot. Yeah, it's like a sick move, bro. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm also just showing how I, I that I haven't heard someone say that's heinous in a long time. I mean, I don't think they have. Way. Yeah, it's just a weird thing, but it's been a while. 
Um, <laughs> There's a comedy bang bang. All right. Does anyone else have any final thoughts so we can wrap up on, on Bill and Ted? Excuse me. Wrapping up any thoughts on Bill and Ted, uh, Excellent Adventure, Bogus Journey, or Face the Music? Yeah, I feel like Face the Music made it a really well-rounded trilogy. It kind of, it clo- for a series of movies that's all about closing loops, it kind of closed the even bigger loop yeah. throughout the entire thing of, you know, great expectations and, and just, you know, how, <laughs> as Lucas said, we're redeemed by our children. But how it really does tie the whole lot of stuff together, even with the fact like the daughters going on their father's journey, you know, recreating their footsteps and being able to come through the, you know, with the song because they're supported by their parents in the end. It rounds out a trilogy that until I saw it, I didn't think needed rounded out. So that's kind of my general yeah. Also, I just sorry to throw out there for I'll, I'll go in X actually, but I just realized we've not talked about the great William Sadler and it's the time who <laughs> they melvined me. They melvined <laughs> me. Yeah, his first sequence, by the way, was him doing hopscotch, and apparently he <laughs> twisted or broke his foot doing the hopscotch because he was in the platform shoes. And him, oh, the rest of that scene is him powering through at like what age 70 or something doing that even the limited walking he's doing that's him with a really fucked up foot but um, him just playing games by himself yeah which is so sad (laughs) one of those things too that i didn't realize i don't think until this third one uh and i think that they played it up so much about someone playing games by yourself as i i used to play bass for a long time is kind of like playing bass by yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Just laying down a line for no one else to put a fucking solo over. It's just like, <laughs> like I, I can sit here for and play the sickest bass line from like Alice in Chains Wood for six minutes and no one else. It's not the same as when you're playing it in the group. No, I, that's, that's, why, that's why we need Becky's triangle. Yeah, or my flute. Yeah. You know. Like Flute duo there are the shiz, y'all. I think so. But yeah, overall, I do think Face the Music is, it rounds out the trilogy really well, but if you are going to introduce anybody to it, I do think you should just do Face the Music, and then if they're that interested, go back. Because I feel like there's plenty there, and it feels like a little bit more contemporary for some people. Not my uh, wife. Um, I think Face the Music is clearly the best movie of the three, but I also don't know if it's the best movie without the groundwork from the other two for all the things that it brings back. I, I mean, I would kind of, I, I don't know. I think maybe 2020 is such a shit year <laughs> and people have lived through it that I think that it might still, I really do feel like it still might hit like a certain way um, where you could watch like a quick five minute primer on the first two and be kind of cool with out seeing them right away at least i mean i don't know i just feel like if i i don't know i just feel like i made a mistake calculated mistake with my wife because i really feel she would have enjoyed that third movie because of all the heart and you know all the love between the the fathers the wives and the daughters and all that i i just really feel like it would have hit the right note but i didn't i didn't do the machete cut if it were but and so so maybe don't binge all three is what you're saying if someone's never seen them yeah i again i would stick with face the music (laughs) But no, but rewatching the first two, though, there is a lot good there. And I think I, I, if I rewatch them again with a, a, a better audience, I think I would probably not feel as weird as I did. And not just with that one bad scene in the callback uh, to it in mm-hmm. Bogus. But, but yeah, I think it's worth it. I would do face the music first, but they are. I mean, put it this way. I do not regret buying them on Amazon so I could rewatch oh. them. I, I bought them. I am very glad I did. And Same. I wish I bought the Blu-ray DVD or 4K mix or whatever, because I know they probably have extra features that I would be really excited about. So. Um, Nick, it's kind of like you ever watch a movie that completely scared you as a kid, and then like, you bring someone over, like, oh, you got to watch this. This is this. I mean, you're probably not. I don't you like horror movies as much, but you're like, oh, this movie scared me so much. And then you you watch it with like a, a date, and they and you realize it's not scary anymore, <laughs> and you're making them sit through a movie that's not what you remember. Yeah, that's kind of it's kind of similar. Like I my memory of of Excellent Adventure was it was really funny and to not hear my other co- audience member not really laughing. I was It makes you so self-conscious it. about it. It does. Yeah, yeah. So I remember talking up Jacob's Ladder and how scary that was 
for the longest time and then watching it with a date and her falling asleep because she was bored by it. And just yeah. being like, oh, yeah. It, okay. Uh, Jess, what did you, what, what are your closing thoughts on Bill and Ted? I wonder how a younger person would feel about these movies. Like, I know my younger brother, like, he knows what they are. I think he vaguely remembers watching them with me when he was younger. But I wonder if, like, what is it, like, Gen Z would feel about these movies? Because, I mean, it's clearly targeted towards us and the people who know the old ones and all of that. Like, it's not targeted towards a new audience, I feel, so... Yeah, that's true. At least especially I re- with space and music. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I remember that's what I thought about like watching some of these and rewatching some today. I was just like, I wonder what a younger person would feel about this movie. When we watched Clueless, that's one of the things we talk about in that episode. I don't know if it's by the time this gets released, I don't know if that's come out before or after this, but I will say Clueless had this weird thing where because they're rich kids, they're walking around with cell phones. And so in one way, the movie has aged well, but you lose out on the joke that they're rich kids and that's why they have cell phones. You know what I mean? Like you, you, yeah. man, you pick up on their rich snobby kids in other ways, like their clothes and their attitude and stuff. But that was like an extra little punch up, you know, about that. And it's lost. Matter of fact, but it makes it feel modern because all the kids can, are talking about paging and texting and or not yeah, technically texting via pager and answering cell phones. It's bizarre. And I do wonder with those, these movies in retrospect, if that applies, I, I, you know, there's one or two things in excellent adventure. I remember going, Oh, this, like uh, the whole, are you, let's reach out and touch somebody, Ted. They will yeah. not get that reference at all. And I don't know how that would play, <laughs> but that's why I don't like the Shrek movies anymore. The, the first one I think holds up. Yes. Because everyone will forever be taught Disney movies. But the yes. second and third one, and I like the second one a lot, but it's all based on pop culture jokes that they are not Disney movies, and that can go either way, unfortunately. But Becky, what what were around finish? Uh, what what did you think? I liked it. It. I'm glad they released it this year oh, because in this shit show of a year where there is nothing good, and we've watched a lot of really dark stuff because mm-hmm. that's where we're at. And where we've been at and it was nice just to and i want travis didn't watch it with me i think he's seen the first one i don't know if he's seen this he does not love bill and ted like i love bill and ted there's that oh, bad decisions there's all that. around travis well i haven't seen this yet <laughs> but i'll look it up but in my head though it just still plays well being that i know travis so i t- i i will but i mean it was nice just to watch something where it, it felt good like the characters liked each other that they had good relationships it had a good satisfying heartfelt happy ending in a year where because i mean i watched it you know when it came out so like pre-election pre everything just everything was bad and Mm -hmm. it was nice to have like that happy ending that little bit of feel good just like oh finally well, and to, to kind of go on what you're talking about, too, something we haven't really talked about, but the way they save the world is it's not just the daughters that are the ones that save the day and they're just there to help, you know, to accompany it. Yeah. But it's also the fact that everyone around the world throughout time and space are working together, which is something we're having a hard time as the human race <laughs> to do right now because we suck. And I think that was the other thing too that I think really hit was like, hey, I don't know how to play a music instrument, but I'm going to try playing it because I, I just, this is, yeah, we're all in this together. Let's go ahead and, and you just wish for a second that I wish we all felt that we were in this together yeah, and not, yeah, yeah, yeah. man, I'm with you hundred percent. It was, I, I agree. Good, good. Becky, thanks for bringing that up. That ending, it was so good, and it, it had a message, but it also and it was uplifting and happy without being saccharine. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it it hit so hard just because it is this year, and yeah. everything yeah. sucks. And if one more person says we're all in this together, I'm gonna punch them because clearly we're not, or <laughs> stuff wouldn't be going down the way it's going down. 
here's the thing. And deep down, you want to say we are in this together. And Absolutely. People mean it. The problem is people don't mean it. And that's what yeah. is so sad. Yeah. And frustrating and anger inducing and and yeah. Like they like, they say it and then they go do something stupid and selfish and I haven't eaten at a restaurant since March. I mean, I've ordered a lot of, you know, DoorDash, you know, I'm Oh, yeah. doing totally. My part to, Same. you know, try to support the economy, but damn it, I'm I want to go eat a restaurant. I want to pay somebody to bring me food and take away the dishes for me so that my lazy ass doesn't have to. Yes. (laughs) Make it hot. You know, Jim Bob or Joey, whoever brought it to you, maybe forgot to have like a heat bag with them to keep it warm. (laughs) And now it's just, you get like very, you know, you want some good tapas, but you're not going to get good tapas. Why? Because Joe Bob forgot the heat bag. I'm with you. Like, I don't mean to stereotype, but you're not going to get good tapas at a place where Joe Bob is making tapas. Well, no, Joe story. Bob works at DoorDash, though. He, they change it out. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they make good tapas there. It's good when it's fresh and hot and right there at the restaurant. But when Joe Bob and, and, and Jill Sue go pick it up, that's where shit goes wrong. And, and I love my house, but I'm also kind of sick of my house. I just, I just can't wait to be able to cancel plans to stay home because I want to stay home. I don't want to be forced to stay home. I want to choose to go home to stay home by telling someone I can't go to wherever the fuck they want me to go. When hermit time is a choice. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because we're, 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 there's power in that. There, it, it's the few things of control you can feel that you have in a world with no control. Where you're like, hey, you still coming overnight? No, I got things to do. Look, Sorry. I'm tired and I'm close to leveling up in Assassin's Creed. Let's when just... pajama time is a treat and not the first half of my work day every day. Yeah. Yeah. I shower at lunch and then I put on real clothes then. But I the first half of my work day is pajama time. Well, I, 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 will that's I, sweep. I absolutely love being back to work from home. It reminds me when I was freelancing and I fucking love it. Way, I do guys, love working from home. This is all first world problems though. Be, or te- oh, yeah. technically because, it uh, is. Our, Jess is yeah. first yeah, world. We're, we're third world. <laughs> well, uh, Jess is on the front line. That's fucking so. first world shit, man. So. That's true. Partially, like, not detrimental. Like, I've been out. I've been places. And, like, I'm really careful when I go out. But it's, like, okay. part of it is, like, I'm around patients with COVID all the time. So I'm, like, yeah, I can go to Target. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can go to the mall. It's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I, I mask up and go to Target. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you mask up. You go. You smell your soap through your mask. And I have eaten at Bob Evans. <laughs> hey, that's down on the farm. They have good cooking on the farm. They do. They they do a very good job keeping you the fuck away from everyone else. So I'm like, okay. It's, it probably doesn't help, too, that not a lot of people like going down to the farm even before the, the pandemic. <laughs> really? So, which bottomless hot chocolate, Nick. Bottomless hot chocolate. Oh, I know. Oh my god, oh. yes. And whipped cream. Here's the thing. I get whipped cream, and I get. I drink the whipped cream first, so then it would look like I'm holding a cup of Joe, make me feel like an adult. Because <laughs> I don't drink coffee. But you know what, though, since what? we're uh, since we are able to even do this remotely, I'm on my second bourbon, Damn. and I don't have to drive home from Nick's. So that is I'm, true. I'm, Keeping it classy, I'm Eric. Making this work for me. This whole Zoom thing makes the Mad Lab board meetings so much better. <laughs> oh my God, I'm with you. I'm with you 100. percent By the way, I think we're kind of wrapped up talking about Bill and Ted. I think so. so that, that, that sounds like Jessica was starting into plugs. Guys, thank you so much for 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 doing this. This was a blast, and we will see you all next time. The Good, the Bad, and the Geeky is presented by D4K Studios. Executive producer is Nick Argenbright. Co-producers are Ashley Carlson and Catherine Ranella. The Good, the Bad, and the Geeky is also made possible by our Kickstarter backers. To see our backers, check out our show notes over at gbgpodcast.com. Our theme and end credit tracks for The Good, the Bad, and the Geeky are by chiptune artist Hide Your Tigers. You can check out their music by going to hideyourtigers.bandcamp.com. We also feature the track from Futurama, The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings, an arrangement by our own Nathan Haley. If you enjoy our program, be sure to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and to leave a review or subscribe to wherever podcasts are streamed. Get out of here without cheese! You're a creep! Go away!
Hey, we're having a good time until you show up, cheapers. Go uh, have some coffee with cream or something, because I'll tell you something. This is a happy place.